Just before we get into today's podcast, I just wanted to say two things, really. Firstly, we've had lots of new followers recently, which is fantastic. Very small favour for those new followers. If you get a chance and you could leave us a review on your chosen podcast platform, that would be fantastic. It really helps other people find the podcast and increase the visibility of our profession. Also, if it's your first time listening and you haven't followed us, please click on the follow button on your chosen platform. Otherwise, on to today's podcast. Welcome to the Fisher Spotlight Podcast. My name is Simon Lipscomb and thank you very much for listening. Today I'm delighted to say that my guest is Ninian Wilson. Ninian is the Global Supply Chain Director and CEO of the Vodafone Procurement Company. Uh, he's been with Vodafone since 2009 and has previously held CPO roles in both Royal Mail and Cable and Wireless. So Ninian, thank you so much for, for joining me for this conversation today. I guess as a starting point, here you are sat in the most senior supply chain and procurement role in a FTSE 100 company with 300 million plus customers around the world. I'm really interested to understand when you're talking to your board about supply chain, what are, what are the issues on, on your mind at the moment? No problem at all. And, and Simon, good to be here. So thank you for the invitations, which is most appreciated. From a supply chain perspective, I think the dialogue and the dynamic really changed probably 2019, 2020, when right. suddenly we got all of these supply chain interruptions, everybody had to work at home, lots of questions around how digital you were. And then the whole topic really for the board is around geopolitical risk and supply chain resilience. And both okay. of those two items are kind of linked together, Simon, yeah? Geopolitical risk must be a fascinating topic for an organisation the size of Vodafone and with an operations as, as vast as yours. How are you even beginning to, to unpick that as a challenge, particularly in this world, which seems very disruptive by standards of traditional times? Yeah, we did a lot of work, Simon, with our external affairs department and being clearly a lot younger than yourself, I wish I was. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I, I didn't actually realize that global trade and globalization of trade is a relatively new phenomenon, right? It was really only in the mid 70s that this globalization effort really kind of took off. Okay. And then obviously doubled down through the 80s and 90s and, and the early 2000s. So really for us, it was having a good look at actually our global supply chains as they exist today and beginning to map almost at a component level where things come from, where they're made, where they're manufactured, where they're assembled, etc. And when we spoke to the board about it, we actually took them a couple of examples of pieces, small pieces of telecommunications equipment yeah. that are deemed to be European but if you look at them, there's some, the insides are like 85% Chinese, right? And so really unpicking at a component level is where we went so that we could actually share with the board where our key areas of component manufacture were, which went into finished products, which then we used to sell either to run our, our networks or to sell to our customers. So it became quite a forensic piece of work and uh, quite a voyage of discovery, I must admit, Simon, quite a, quite a discovery voyage, yeah. Yeah. To your point on globalisation, Indian, are you planning for a post-globalisation world? Like, are you looking at global supply chains differently to how you looked at them five years, 10 years ago, for example? I think definitely from 10 years ago. I think okay. it was quite natural for people to say, well, we can produce this type of product and we can buy it from an Italian manufacturer or a French manufacturer or a British manufacturer for this much. But if we just simply move it to China, we can save this much Right. And I think that discussion has changed to, uh, yes, you could, but should you? Right. And have you thought about supply chain resilience? Have you thought about risk? And how have you taken that into consideration in your procurement and physical logistics operations? So are you considering these things? Ten years ago, that wasn't really a discussion point. And in fact, we had okay. targets to move spend to lower cost countries 10 years ago. Now we have resilience objectives from the boards and a level of analysis they would like us to do in all of our tenders, which is very different positioning from the previous decade, shall we say. Yeah. Are the main concerns for your organisation in terms of geopolitical, uh, some talk about China, Taiwan, you know, the, the, the huge amount of semiconductor production, chip manufacture. Are, are those the kind of issues that are changing your businesses perceiving risk in supply chains? Again, if you wind the clock back a little bit, we're a European and African business. 
Okay. And from a European perspective, Europe had the ability to look both ways at once, right? So Europe looked at America as an important market for European products, services, cars, etc. And it also looked at China as an important market. And that dynamic has changed significantly over the last eight years, where we've seen geographic competition, basically, between the US and China. And yep. we are beginning to see, I think some would say, a little bit of protectionism beginning to creep in. And I think for procurement and supply chain professionals, protectionism is a very bad thing, right? Because you tend yeah. to get higher pricing, you're not getting the level of competition we'd like to see, and you're not getting the level of efficiency in the supply chain you'd like. So certainly that is a consideration. We are not actively reshoring work, but we are asking all the questions to our partners of, tell me about your supply chain. Tell me how dependent you are on America or how dependent you are on China, as an example. And yeah. then tell me, what are you going to do if something goes wrong? So we're having a number of war game sessions, if you want to call it that, with our supplier partners over the next couple of months, actually, just to just go through some what ifs. Okay. And that's a deliberate action we've taken from the board to say, what if this happened, what would you do? And I think some companies are probably ahead of us on that. And some companies are probably not as far advanced as we are. But I think it's something all professionals should think about that. What are you going to do if this happens? You can't yeah. predict the future, but you can yeah. react to it if you've thought about it. Yeah. We've been lucky enough to talk to lots of supply chain people over the course of this podcast. You never really previously thought too much about this topic of globalization, global politics. I'm interested as a supply chain professional, how are you understanding the complexity of the inputs at that political layer, right? You've got you know countries all over the world, you've got changing governments, you've got uncertainty, you've got wars, you've got a lot of things going on. And I'm really interested to understand how as a supply chain professional taking all those inputs and in, into something that you can meaningfully plan or action. We're fortunate enough as a company such as Vodafone, we have a number of connections with local governments. Okay. Uh, obviously in the countries in which we operate, we've got strong connections with some multi national other corporations who are customers as well so you can get inputs from customers you yeah. can get inputs from NGOs you get inputs from government and we have a whole team uh, of external affairs who collate all of that information which becomes a go-to point for me so I can go to them and say you know what is the impact of this and how is this impacting how we work together and obviously we have other professional trade organizations which we're members of as well so I think from our perspective, there's multi-sources of information. Yeah, yeah. The difficult piece is coming up with a cohesive picture of yes. where you are today and kind of where it's moving to. But then also that's why you have boards who've got very experienced individuals on it who also have different perspectives. So we take perspectives from everywhere we can and then we try and synthesize that down into our supply chain strategy. Yeah. And, and then it, is it fair to say in, in that scenario, so moving out of the, the globalization where I'm probably oversimplifying, but I'm guessing a lot of what you were trying to do was was cost-based, to your point earlier about being encouraged to offshore, to now a much more nuanced conversation about supply chain risk. I guess to some extent as a procurement professional, there's a, a premium to that. Looking at supply chain resilience, does that come at a cost? And are you having to trade off an increase in price? Because oftentimes companies don't want to think about the thing until it goes wrong, and that's the, the driver. But it sounds <laughs> like you're ahead of that. I think if you wind the clock back, it wasn't just cost. Okay. It was also quality and innovation yep. from di from different countries who'd specialize in different things. And that was the part of the value that globalization delivered, right? So and made some countries massively successful because they specialized in certain areas. So so it was definitely a cost innovation and quality decision back then. Yeah. The yeah. resilience question is a great question because I was with a CEO of one of our key partners last week. He happened to be in a meeting room next to mine and popped in, right, for a wee chat, okay. as you do. And he said to me, Ninian, if I move manufacturing from A to B, would you be willing to pay the premium? And I said, it's a great question. Yeah. And I said, it's one I'll take to the board. And I think companies now would be willing to pay some of the premium. Yeah. But I did smile to him and say, of course, I'd like to have a more resilient supply chain, but pay the same as if it was in a less resilient location, which is me wanting to have my cake and eat it, obviously. But in the job title. Yeah, yeah I think it's kind of in the job title. But I also understand that balance between resilience, supply chain and, you know, the lowest cost, which could be a, you know, a place in, I don't know, Malaysia or Philippines. And then you've got all the logistics risk, yeah. which you've got nowadays as well. So, so I think it is a trade off. 
is it an easy trade-off for companies to make? No, I think it's incredibly difficult because yeah. globalization has effectively meant deflation of prices for a lot of industries for many years. Yeah. And that's be begun to change over the last couple of years with inflationary pressure. Plus, we know that if we brought manufacturing of a component from let's say, China back to France, the cost base is different. And the only way you can get close to the cost base in the Far East is perhaps to in innovate more around automation. Yeah. So for us, you, we can talk about a, a Macron position, which is around let's bring all the manufacturing back to France yeah. as part of resilience, or more of uh, the German position, which is let's make sure we don't end up in a single source position where we're sourcing everything from one country. So diversify the supply chain as a supply chain professional i'm a little bit more on the make sure we have diversification of supply we have thought through because you think you might have diverse supply because you've got more than one supplier but if they've all got down at tier three the same company they're buying from you haven't really got diversity yeah. so therefore the yeah. ability to look through the supply chain and assess that level of diversity down at tier three tier four is really really important and it's been incredibly difficult to do yeah but now with digitization it's, it's getting a little bit easier yeah and then yeah, that's the other topic i was fascinated to talk to you about so in our pre-call for this podcast it's very clear that for you and your team in Vodafone, in innovation around procurement and supply chains is a huge part of what you're doing and looking at. I'm just really interested in terms of what what are the areas, the things that you're looking at in, in that innovation space? Yeah, a few years ago, we set up a joint innovation lab centre, if you want to call it that, with the Luxembourg government, with the aim of taking scale-up companies, so companies that have got funding, got a product, got revenue, and seeing if we could scale those both within Vodafone and our partners. That's proven to be quite successful, but it takes time to establish your position. So that's more of a company approach for us in terms of okay. how we can help bring innovation to the company and create new products and services. For the procurement function, I think everybody is probably reading books on chat GPT and AI and yeah. all of this and all of that. And I just remind colleagues, I think two things. First of all, you are at the peak of the hype cycle on okay. AI. So yeah. hype cycle is really high. And therefore, everybody says, oh, it will drop. But I think it does drive fundamental cha change in how we run supply chain management. It changes immeasurably forecasting, for sure. Okay. It changes probably how we do lower level procurement and what we can automate. It will change how internal clients relate to us. So we could have way more. We haven't got yet, but we'll have internal chatbots for clients because clients internally still get lost because our systems aren't brilliant. Yeah, And then performance management of the suppliers. We certainly envisage some categories of spend being end-to-end -end digital okay. with zero human input, zero, okay. through that process. And we don't see why that can't be done. So we have some tooling that we've invested in. It's nearly there. It looks at the marketplace. It runs the tender. It's doing it. The team tell me it's doing a little bit of negotiation. I'm not sure I completely believe them yet. Okay. Uh, then it's signing the contracts and uploading it into our ERP system. But if you think of that, all the components for that capability are already there. All we're doing is stitching them together, right? You can do e-signature. It's easy. Yeah. We actually understand, because we've got a contract repository, what points we give on in a negotiation, Simon. We know this. Yeah? Okay. And we've got, yeah. we do 3,000 contracts a year. So we've got 30,000 contracts as a database of what we've given on and what we yeah. don't give on. What you won't, yeah. Yeah. So for me, that automation, I think, is a real opportunity for us. And if I think back to sort of when I was young, yeah, around about 2000, when we were all in the e-procurement boat and the e-auctions, right? Yeah, yeah. This is a more fundamental change than that was. So this is like the second S-curve for supply chain professionals. And I think if you've got an opportunity now, get on the bus, as okay. I would say, go and speak to your CEO, go and put some use cases up, try some stuff, get a little bit of learning, because this is also an opportunity to reposition procurement and supply chain around adoption of innovation and adoption of new technology and driving more value. I see some of my colleagues are using AI to help them in negotiations, right? Yeah. So the next word you should say, Simon, is X, or this is how you should now position. Yeah. So you can see this eventually becoming kind of a battle of the bots, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I would love to negotiate with Cyril at BT because he's got his negotiation support. I'll have my negotiation support. We can see who kind of wins, right? Uh, I, think, I think we'd all but, like to watch that, Ninian. That would be, yeah, be, be a great, great show. Yeah, it would. <laughs> but but I think, the, do you not think the opportunity is amazing for procurement now to adopt some of these technologies yeah. and show it in their business? 
because if your procurement processes are well known and adopted, then transforming them and adding AI and thinking about how you automate and bring in that capability and be a leader in your business on it, why not? Why not for procurement to be a leader in adoption? Yeah. It's really interesting, Nidhi, because you can see when you talk to you about the topic, you're very passionate and positive and you're forward looking and opportunity looking. Do you think to some extent there's, there's also a threat to individuals in our profession that if they're not on that bandwagon, it's all about, as you say, that they can be left behind? Yeah, I think some of your some of the people who will be listening to the podcast will, will not remember this. But I remember when we got the first laptop when I worked at British Gas. And I remember people saying, oh, I'm not sure about this laptop stuff. You know, it's going to change our life. We'll all lose our jobs and there'll be no, no work to do. Right. I'm not sure that's what's happened. I think there's more work uh, because of it. Yeah. <laughs> yes, yeah. So I think roles will change, Simon, for sure. Yeah. I think when we started our analytics journey sort of eight, nine years ago, we brought in some data scientists to help us because we didn't have that skill and capability. And now quite a few of our people have learned that skill and capability, a different skill. And I think we'll see the emergence of new skills and new capabilities, people who understand how to teach the machine. Yeah, Because you don't just buy a machine and go plow a field, right? You got, yep. You've actually got to teach these models and these models are going to learn how to do things. So learning and tuning of models, I think, will become more important. And in reality, in procurement, I don't know what it's like for everybody else, but I never have enough people. And the company's never going to give me any more, Simon, right? So I've yeah. always got quite a bit of procurement spend I can just never get to. I can yeah. never get to it, right? So one, I can get to the spend. Two, I can take some of the cruddy work away because we still have some cruddy work, right? And I think I was speaking to one of the large consultancies. They were saying 80% of their tender responses are now written by chat GPT, 80% of the responses, yeah. yeah? So if you can release that capability to do more relationship management, to do more strategic thinking, to add more value to your internal clients or your external clients, then I think that's that's a good thing. So it's kind of a glass half full empty. I'm, I'm, I'm a little bit more yeah. half full than, than half empty sort of person, yeah? Yeah, as you say, we're in the we're in the hype cycle. I think everyone would agree on on AI, particularly at the moment. Having been through, I guess, some of these hype cycles before. If you were listening to this podcast, you're a procurement CPO in a perhaps a smaller business and maybe doesn't have access to some of the innovation you do. What what advice would you have for for someone? See. So, so you can actually make some positive steps into this topic, but without getting distracted, brought down by the hype, confused, because <laughs> there's a lot of confusion in the market. Where do you even start? I would even start on Copilot for Microsoft, right? Okay. It helps you write emails. Yeah. And take the minutes of meetings and play them back to you, right? So Yeah, yeah, yeah. And it's really, and it's what, what 30 bucks a month? Uh, you're not going to break the bank, right? And you can have a little bit of learning and say, oh, this is kind of cool. So a little bit of learning on safe ground. Yeah. Now, even with Copilot, you still need to read the email it's written, right? Just in case it <laughs> said something that you didn't quite intend it to say. But certainly get a little bit of learning and then maybe bring in some of the potential people who'd be interested in working with you and say, listen, would you do a proof of concept for me free of charge? Yeah. yeah, to prove your proof of concept because there's value for them also learning how your business works and how their capabilities could could apply and then obviously start small yeah yeah, yeah. don't come in with a, a big it's going to be a million pounds to do this thing because that's not going to fly with some people yeah. but if it's 50k 40k 100k if you can manage that within your budget then perhaps that allows you to get started and show a little bit of success and then when you show a bit of success take it to your chief executive and say look what we've done yeah yeah. Now we've done this, could we have a little bit more money to do this? Yeah. So there, there was a great Accenture methodology. I worked with Accenture for a while when we were doing our e-procurement pieces back in the day in 2000. And they said, start small, think big, scale fast. That was their strategy. Yeah? So start small, yeah. yeah, think big, but then scale fast. And I think if you follow that methodology, you reduce the risk. But I think the other piece I would say, don't be worried about failing. Yeah, And I know this is a very difficult word, especially for people in the Western and European world. The word failure is not something we do, right? Everything, all our KPIs are always green and we're always great people because we do a wonderful job. But just going in to our board or saying to our executive team, saying we're going to try a few things. Some of them might not work and we'll feed back what the learning is from the things that didn't work, yeah? Yeah. It becomes a really healthy discussion. As opposed to, I know even myself, sometimes I go, it hasn't worked. I go, oh my goodness, how am I going to deal with this, right? Yeah. So being a little bit confident around that things not working, but getting the learning. As long as something works, I mean, if everything fails, then it's probably not great, <laughs> right? You do need to get something working, yeah? 
Yeah. Ninia, that seems like a appropriate place to draw the conversation to conclusion. It's as always a genuine privilege to talk to someone at your level in an organisation of your size to understand the things on your mind. So uh, thank you for taking the time to talk to us and our listeners about that. No problem at all. It was really great to, to chat, Simon. So thank you. Thanks for listening to today's episode. If you've enjoyed this podcast, please give us a click on the follow button on your chosen podcast platform. We'd also love to hear your views on either future topics or indeed if you've got any thoughts on future guests that we should look to get into the podcast. Thanks again. See you next time.